Welcome to the Centre for Computing History here in Cambridge. Uh, please tell us who you are, uh, where you worked and what your role was. Uh, well, I, I, my name is Anne Whitworth. I worked for Cadbury Brothers and I was eventually a systems analyst and a computer programmer there. And I've come to talk really about what I did years ago. Now, when we're talking years ago, we're talking back in the 60s, in the I believe, 60s, is that correct? Yes. yes. But tell us a bit first, um, did you go to university or did you go to study at all? I went to university and did a, a course in industrial economics because at that point I thought I was going to go on and be an accountant. Gosh, and when was this? Oh, that was from 56 to 59. Hmm. And which university? Nottingham. Oh, so there you are, and um, you did your degree. And at that time, were there many other women doing the course at the same time as you were? <laughs> I was the only woman doing industrial economics. <laughs> there were some doing economics, so there were other women in some lectures, but I actually, of 22 students, I was the only one doing industrial economics. Why, why did you choose it? Um, because it exempted you from the intermediate exams of, of chartered accountancy. And so you, you could do a degree. My father wouldn't let me go to university unless I knew what I was going to do afterwards. Um, so that's why uh, I decided I would be an accountant. Um, if you want to know why I didn't carry on, it's really because my father had been paying, uh, gradually paying a certain amount towards my education. He'd spent quite a lot of money on me. And in those days, if you wanted to do chartered accountancy, you had to buy into articles. And some of the places said they would just pay you what they thought you were worth. And I decided I couldn't expect my father to finance that. So I started looking to see what other opportunities there were. I knew nothing much about industry because I lived in the southwest. But I, um, I had to look. There was nothing much in the southwest for me as a graduate. Um, so I had to look further afield. So what sort of things were you looking for at the time? I don't know. I used to say, I like working things out. <laughs> I went to um, Michelin for an interview, I remember. But they told me that what they were offering, I would not be satisfied with because it was more like a glorified secretarial job. And they said, you won't be happy with that. Um, and Cadbury's, there was a, a booklet called a Directory of Opportunities for Graduates. And we went through that with a tooth comb. And I applied to Lewis's, not John Lewis, the old Lewis's as well. I got a, an offer of a job there uh, for management training and I applied to Cadbury's and I took the Cadbury job. Right. So what made you decide between uh, Cadbury's and Lewis then? What was the thing for, for Cadbury's? Do you know, I don't really know now, but I think I thought there was more interest in the industry than in the retail. Although I knew quite a bit about retail because my father was in it. But, mm. but there you are, you arrive at Cadbury's and what happens then? What's the sort of job that you're taking? Well, I, I, I arrived believing I was going to do a certain amount of training uh, management training and then end up in market research. That's what I've been told at interview. When I arrived, they said, oh no, you're not doing that. We've got a 12 month program for you. We will send you around different offices. Um, three months, I think it was, in the factory. Maybe they were knew more ahead than I did. Um, but so I started on that and I learned first all about how they ran their invoicing. And then I learned about how they ran their sort of got their statistics out of their invoicing for their sales figures and the like. Um, then I went into the factory. I did a, a month on, on different belts. I packed milk tray. I packed um, selection boxes. I wasn't very quick at that. A selection box goes past you and you have to... So, but there was always a girl behind to, to catch me up. <laughs> um, but then I, they put me onto the um, side that was doing all the recording of of what was coming off a belt. So I worked for several weeks in the same place on for a belt that was running. They believed you needed to know about the factory if you were going to be a manager anywhere. Um, so you've been through the induction period. Well, I did, I, but I only got so far, you see. I, I then went out of the factory. I went to the, what they called peace rates office. Cadbury's did a lot on peace rates. That's how they paid peace, by the peace. Um, and I was working there when the gentleman I was working with was asked to move to, um, there were 
to join what was called Organisation and Methods. There were two men in Organisation and Methods um, working, looking at the future of things, I think. And he was asked to go and I was asked to move with him. So I stopped my programme of, of, I should have gone on to wages and other things, but I didn't. I went with him and we were the beginning of a team to look, to see what Cadbury's first computer might be. Why did they decide to have a computer? Um, well, I suppose because having a computer, they believed, would save a lot of, a lot of staff, a lot of money. I mean, it, it was heavily dependent on women doing Hollerith processing and the like. There were lots of Hollerith machines, a lot of... So there you are, and there's, there's talk of looking at the first, first computers. So tell us a bit about how that worked, finding the first computer and how you were involved. Um, well, we spoke, we had, I can remember sitting in a committee, in a sort of small room, and some of them would come from a computer firm and talk to us about their, com their computer, and I can remember finding it very boring at times. Um, but um, they would come, so we, we actually spoke to five firms. Um, I may not remember who the five were, but we did. We spoke to five different firms, and they came in. Um, I don't remember going out to visit anyone other than to go and visit Ferranti. I certainly went to Ferranti in Manchester. Um, I don't think I went anywhere else. I think it was all done by them. We told them what the job was. Um, and I mean, I knew pretty well because I'd worked, the first things Cadbury's were going to put on were their invoicing and, and then the statistics following from it. Mm -hmm. And then they were going to go on to stock patrol control. And later, I think they believed they'd go to wages and the like, but that was in the future. So I had been working in the offices whose work they were going to put on the computer. Yeah. So you had the practical I'd experience got, already. You could. Yes, and I got the contacts. It. I knew the people. I, I'd got the contacts, yes. So um, were you involved in the decision-making then? Well, I don't... It's difficult to say. The, the report that was written to recommend it was... Is, um, the name at the end is the name of the man I went with, that I was working with. Um, and yes, I must have been, um, because I must have been working out how many... <laughs> how many pages... Well, you see... You had to look also at what you were going to use. We had to produce, Cadbury's wanted a cost case. So we had to know how much paper, and not just how many women we might use, how many punch card operators we might need, and how many ta paper tape operators and the like. But you needed to know how, how many Hollerith cards you were going to use or how much paper. And I certainly remember being involved in designing invoices um, and thinking about how much paper we were going to use. I do remember that. Uh, talking to the Kalamazoo used to do paperwork. Whether we got it from Kalamazoo, I don't remember, but it was one of the firms that was involved. And yes. I mean, nowadays you can buy a computer for your home or for work for 500, 600 pounds. What sort of budget was the company looking at at the time? Um, in, the, in the region of, uh, say, 170 to 200 and something thousand pounds. For the, but that's not, just, that's not just for the central core computer, that's for the various peripherals as well. I mean, Ferranti only made computers. They didn't, um, they would use other people's uh, machines for cards, for reading and, the, and for paper tape reading. They didn't, they didn't use their own for that. Um, so we had to look at which peripherals we would have, whose peripherals. Um, Can you tell me what the computer was that was installed? Yes, it was a, a Ferranti Orion. Ferranti had made some others, and this was their new one, Ferranti Orion. Mm. They named them after the, 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 the planets or something. <laughs> yes, because they got Mercury as well. Yeah. Mm. So this, and this was, what year was this? Well, we, um, I joined that department in 1960. We produced uh, a report on what input we needed in June 1961. And we produced the report saying which computer we'd buy in August 1961, when we recommended the Ferranti Orion. Um, and it looks as though I think I started doing the using, you know, prog well, not started, yes, probably started programming in June 1963. I mean, I think 
the installation came in 1964, sometime in 64. It took a number of years. So it took, yes, I think they told us it was a two and a half year waiting, something like that. Yeah, I mean, there were other people ahead of us. We weren't going to, this was a new computer. Uh, this, this was new, for, I don't think it made two or three other com computers before. This was new. Um, and uh, so there were other people and when I went on courses, I met people from, say, GEC. Um, Metalbox in Worcester were having one ahead of ours. GEC had theirs ahead of us. Norwich Union had theirs ahead of us. And I certainly went down to Norwich Union working overnight using their computer to prove our programs before we had a computer. Because we had to be ready, didn't we, for when it came. So you're already preparing for the arrival of the computer um, several months in advance. Oh, yes. So what did you have to do? Uh, what sort of program did you have to go through to learn? Oh, I, I, I did lots of courses. <laughs> in, I, I, I have memories of going to London several times. Um, Ferranti may have had their research and so on in Manchester, but they had headquarters as well in London. And we would go down and stay in a hotel for a couple of weeks at a time and um, have lectures a lot on, on the on the, pro on the initial programming language, which was called Nebula, but it wasn't ready for us. So we spent time learning all about Nebula, and then we were told, sorry, it won't be ready in time. Um, you've got to learn another language, so you had to go back and do more courses. Uh, uh, over a very hot summer, as I recall. Yes, um, so they, they gave us a lot of training. Um, and later, when we were dealing with stock, they actually gave us a person to work in our office with us, but that was later on, you know, sort of later on. And how did you find learning these computing languages and the thought of oh, working Oh, that was right up my street. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, my A-level, one of my A-levels was in mathematics. So, and I'd always said I like working things out. So it, when I was asked to move to that department, I say I was in the right place at the right time. It absolutely suited me. It's really what I enjoyed. Can't say I ever didn't enjoy my work. Yeah. That's lovely. So you really, you really enjoyed the planning for the for the computer. Oh, yeah, I mean it was it was a lot of involvement. Yes, I mean, yes, it was it was fascinating really. Um, lots of things to sort of work out, and then then programming, and um, uh, yes, and then you you get your programs, they, you, you, your program was put on the computer and they would run it and they, of course it, it wouldn't work first time and, and the person running it would come back and give it back to you and say well it stopped at such and such a point. They always knew where it had failed as it were. We had things called flow charts and you, f you, f you flowed the job, you, you, uh, you know, and you are, it's all questions that can be yes or no answers. That's, it's completely yes or no. So you you know, is it this, is it greater than this, is it less than this, or whatever. And you get branching as you go down. And so then, with the programming, you follow what you've worked out already as how to, how to do it. So we talked about the, um, the Nebula language and then the basic input language. But what did you actually do in programming? How did you program? Uh, we, we had, I had a, a chart that helped me, but I had to actually have codes so that if I wanted to add two items together, I had to use a code, say zero, 00 would mean add, and then whatever was in register A to whatever was in register B, and, and then put the answer in register C. So really down to each step that you wanted to do. So if it was price by quantity, and the answer would be how much somebody was going to pay. Um, and I, I had a a code sheet that I worked through and we knew exactly where we had to know what a word of a of a com in a com in the computer was it was 48 bits and you had to put you had to know how long anything was um, how how the biggest price you could have the biggest number of letters in somebody's line of address because we, we were working in alphanumeric not just not just numeric um, and we really had to know, we wouldn't have had to with Nebula, I think, but because Nebula wasn't ready, we had to have far more hands-on programming. We called it basic input language, but 
It's not what many people will have known as, a, as BASIC, which I think is an acronym, probably. But that meant, then, if you were looking at stock control or invoicing, you had to break the task down, is that Absol right? Absolutely. So can you talk, talk a bit more about how you would tackle that? I mean, before you could even start programming, you had to look at exactly what you were going to put on the, on the finished document. And you had to know where the person's address was going and, and exactly how many lines you could get on. So that when you actually programmed, I mean, there were things called jumps. You would jump back. You go so far through a bit of program and you jump back. So you would go down and you count, you'd add one to a counter as after every line you did. And when you got to, say, 17, you'd say, is it equal to 17? Yes. And you no longer jump back. You went on to the next bit. And you had to break everything down to know exactly what you were trying to produce um, to get on your final piece of paper to send to somebody so that they paid it. So there's several parts to this. There's the programming which you have to plan yourself, how that's going to go. Uh, and then you have to input to the computer. Yes, so but how I was didn't that? do that. Oh, mean, right. You don't do anything. <laughs> I never touched that computer. Uh, I worked in an office, at a, you know, at a desk doing this. I gave what I had done to a, a, to a punch room, which was adjacent, and they punched up and produced paper tape, which had my program on it. That was then given to the, to the computer room, uh, who would run it possibly overnight, certainly at times overnight. Um, they might even call me in in the evening, so that I, if we were under pressure, you get called in to um, put, the, put it right um, and, and put it back in, yes. Um. But you've, pl you've planned, you've learnt, and then the computer arrives. Can you tell us a bit about Do you know, about I don't that? remember much about <laughs> It must have been a, a major event, mustn't it? But it arrived... We were, we were in an office next door to the computer room. I mean, it's a large room. And, but we had nothing to do. And in those days, you had to have engineers in. I mean, there were engineers from Ferranti worked there. And they had to have the computer for two hours every morning before it could start working for us. I don't know what they had to do to it, but they had to go through. And all the programs, of course, had to be compiled, as they would call it, um, before they would, could run. But, yeah, we, I might have put my nose in, but basically I knew nothing about... I knew what the things were called, the different, you know, tape decks and the like. But... Um, so was it a very big machine compared to what we have nowadays? <laughs> Certainly. I, I, I remember going on a, on a visit around an office some years later, and I said, well, where's your computer? And they said, oh, it's, it's on this box under the desk. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> For some, to me, a computer was an enormous thing. So how big was it? Well, I'm stand sitting in this room with you. I can see a tape deck in front of me. There were six tape decks. There, were, there was an enormous card reader. There were two very big printers, huge things, spewing out continuous paper. Um, and there must have been, you know, a tape reader somewhere. And the desk was certainly as big as the area that you are occupying at the moment. A, you know, a big... I can show you a photo of the desk. Yeah. It, it, it took up quite a large room, and there was some... I don't think the room was air-conditioned, but the tape decks had to be air-conditioned. Um, and it had to be quite clean, I think, probably. Mm. Oh, yes. So what were you using the computer for, then, when, when you were working in, in um, the office? Certainly invoicing. Um, that started while I was there. And, of course, once that started, I don't think I... I, I suppose the programme must have run without them having to come back and say, please correct this or change this, as far as I can recall. And I, I noticed from things I've got that I must have... Um, that I obviously finished up working on the stock movement. Um, I must have, that, that must have been at the end of my time. I know that because I found um, a document I had to complete as a member of the management staff. They, they promoted me to their management staff. They had to create what they call pro professional and technical management, to deal with the likes of us who weren't in charge of a lot of people, but were management by the virtue of the job we did. Um, and I had to describe what I did, and I've got, I, found, I found that document. 
so I know I was working on stock by the time I finished. But I wasn't, wasn't there that long, really. And only two years with the computer, basically. Um, I want to ask you then, you're talking about the stock control, and that was something quite important at the time, mm. because how, how, did, uh, how was the stock sold and distributed? Well, we, I mean, we, it, it, when it left the factory, we, we produced a, a document to put onto it when it left the factory. Mm. And then when it, it, it might go into cold storage for a bit, and if so, there was a, a piece of the document would say that it was for when it was in cold storage. They had to know where it was, as it were. And eventually it would go out to a depot and then from a depot it would be sent out to whatever sweet shop <laughs> wanted it. We didn't, we, this was not the days of supermarkets. Um, this was, you might have a um, self-service shop, you know, we, we had some self-service. But basically it's the days of sweet shops and representatives going around and sitting down with the owner and saying how many boxes or how many bars of this chocolate or whatever do you want. So we're, we're right back in, you know, it's amazing how it's changed now. Um, but do you feel the computer made a big difference then? Well, I think they had a much better idea of where everything was. I think they felt with the stock, they knew how much they'd got where, because they'd got these records coming back all the time, um, instead of almost asking somebody to go and count in the place how much is there. You know, I think they felt there was a, they wanted control on it, but yes. So, when you were in your, in your office, you say you were now remote from the computer, hmm. what did you do and how did the information then flow from where you were through to the computer to be put, to be I input? mean, I start, I had a, a pencil and, or, or a pen and, well, a pencil. Um, I, I did everything on paper. I, I had, to do my flow charts, I had a plastic um, template so you could draw your, a diamond a diamond would give you a split, you know, an answer to yes or no, you could go off the edges of a diamond. A square was an ordinary instruction, um, and you drew straight lines and so on, and we had circles for certain things. So we, we had a template, so when we did it, it all looked neat and tidy and was all the same size. We didn't do that freehand. Um, and then, then I, I, I must have written these lines out. I, I don't really remember, but I must... And, we were trying very hard, and this was a difficult thing. If you change things, you were meant to write down and keep an account of everything you were doing and why. Because if, any, if you weren't there and somebody else had to pick this up, they needed to know what, what the program was doing without just trying to work through it. And that was a hard thing to make sure that you <laughs> documented everything you'd done. Very difficult. But, and then we would give it to a punch card operator and she could type, she would, type, as it were, type in, yes, and it would produce paper tape. Um, and, and uh, yes, and there were, there were machines called flexor writers, which are the same sort of thing, but they would produce a paper as well, I think. Um, and then that, what happened with that paper tape? That, you that then was given to the computer operator to feed in. There were paper tape readers. We had paper tape readers. So the programs were always on paper tape. And then the programs would run, and how long would that take, roughly? I don't really know, but um, when we started, the job was running. I mean, I don't know for actually developing a program. It had to be turned into machine code by the machine. The machine had a compiler that, that converted it from how we'd written it so that it could then run it. Um, I don't actually know how long, because I wasn't... I just know when it would come back sometimes, but I could often leave it to run overnight, you see. And then on the mor in the morning, it might be back on my desk as to whether it had got through or not. Yeah. And at the end of the programme, once the programme had finished running and gone through its calculations, what would come out at the other end? Oh, well, I mean, <coughs> when it was running as a proper programme, um, either uh, invoices on... And they were on, they were on, what do you call it, continuous paper, sprocket-fed, very wide. Um, and I think we got, I'm not sure if we didn't get two side by side, I think we possibly did. Um, so in that case, uh, otherwise a list of, of, of figures for the statistics, and when it was stock control, it was a, a design form that had got sticky bits on the back and it could be, could be attached to, to outers of, I use the phrase outers, that's uh, the boxes of, <laughs> of so many boxes of chocolate or whatever is called an outer, and it could be stuck on and... Um, 
Yeah, and it would have repeat information across it. Uh, they, we normally say that computers save paper nowadays. Uh, to me, it seems like it was actually the other way around at the time. Well, I must admit, we, we costed, and I, you know, worked out how, and then I saw that sometimes the computer could, as it were, go wrong, and would just spew paper out, blank paper. And I'd think, heavens, we didn't allow for all this wastage when we were... Con but in terms of the cost of the whole computer, I suppose the paper really was not that much. But I remember seeing it, spewing it out and thinking, I didn't actually, in my calculations way back, allow for wastage of paper. I just calculated how many invoices we thought we would produce. Yeah. Now, you've already talked about being unusual in terms of the degree that you wanted to do, and then coming in and going into a management position at Cadbury's. How unusual was it for you as a woman to go in at that particular time? Because we're talking the early 60s, where apparently everything was beginning to be emancipated, yes. equal opportunities. Um, well, of course, they, had, they employed a lot of women. Um, and so some of the departments certainly had women. Of course, a lot of the women were not doing management jobs. No, that's true. I mean, we certainly had um, more than one. I mean, I wasn't the only person. As, the, as that department grew, others had the same standing. Um, the invoicing department was run by women, with women. Um, the statistical of, office, well, it wasn't an office, it's a lot of machines, but that was run by a woman and women. Um, they used a lot of women in, as I say, in the factory, they were all, uh, you know, the um, charge hands and the, whatever they called them now, but the, the, there were three levels of management in a, in, a, in a factory room and they would be women. The men were, all, yes, it, it was men if you went actually to making, stirring chocolate, making chocolate and, and getting it, and making bars, that sort of thing. But as soon as you got to wrapping and the like and packing, it was women. So there were, it, was a, it was a company that was very used to having women. But I, I, I must admit other, I mean, if I went into, say, the cost office, I don't think there were women there unless they were typists or the like. I mean, there was a big typing pool in those days. You, I mean, you didn't have, so you didn't have a, a computer on your desk to do your own. So you had a big typing pool. Um, and then there was a post office with a lot of, a lot of women working in a post office. I'm not quite sure what they were sending, but they, they obviously were sending some things off by post. Um, but did you, f did you feel that you were being treated equally within Cadbury's? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, Cadbury's had a rule, you were not allowed to discuss your salary with anyone else. And I don't know if the men were paid more, but um, they promote, you know, they, they increased. It was an interesting place to work. Um, very benevolent sort of place. So each year when I had a rise, I had to go and see my director and sit in his office and he would pass me an envelope and say, thank you for what you've done this last year and here's your, you know, your letter for your rise. And I would have to say thank you, but I had no idea what was in the letter. Um, when I got married, I was presented with a, a carnation and a Bible. Um, and while I was in the office, I was responsible for the women as, uh, for their welfare, because I was the sort of, when it started, I was obviously the senior woman at there at that point when we first started. So um, they always had a, an eye on the women working for them, their welfare. And they decided we got, as we had some women eventually, particularly the, you know, the punch guard girls and this sort of thing, then I, um, I looked after their wel <laughs> welfare, if you like. I didn't really have to do anything much, but, um, so I suppose they were an unusual, for the time, they were, but but the job required women really, yeah. it, it, or not what, my job, but but yes. the general job of the whole whole of mm -hmm. Cadbury's required a lot of women. Mm -hmm. so, it, it's interesting you say a lot of women or a lot of people. What you? Well, a lot of people as well, but some of the places you walked into and it would be all women. Mm. Right. You know, as I say, the invoicing. I don't think we had men in the. Yes, what they, they, they split their, sort of all their invoicing, what they called their general office into two, two areas. And the one was doing the hands-on job, and that was the women. The other was, mm. I don't know, writing letters to customers and all sorts of things, and that was a male dom domain, yes. 
I'd, we'll come back to the computing in a moment, but I want to pick up another thing, because you were there while Cadbury's was still a benevolent Quaker-led yes. society, oh, yes, wasn't it? Yes. And yes. how did that ethos work its way? How, how was that understood within the organisation? Um, interesting. I mean, we all knew we were working for a Quaker family. We, it was in the middle of the Bourneville estate. Um, uh, uh, yes, so we knew, but... Um, I mean, there was no rubbing in of the fact that they were Quakers to you or anything like that. You would, but it was a, a good family firm, as it were. And we, I mean, the, the directors were Mr. Adrian, Mr. So-and-so. They, they didn't use their surnames. But, you know, my director, Mr. Adrian Cadbury, and I knew, I, you know, he would acknowledge me around. He knew who I was. Um, yes, uh, but I can't pinpoint it really for you um, and on yes I just know that they I, I mean I don't know whether it was unusual in those days or not I mean we had they had a they had a doctor on site they had a, a dentist um, you know this sort of thing no I don't know if that's unusual or not I think even, certainly they had them yeah I think even nowadays it, it can and then be they had um, yes it, I mean we were girls <laughs> they weren't women they were girls at Cadbury's and so there was a, a um, Bourneville Girls Athletic and Social Club to which I belonged and, um, and we had various functions and, and, and that was, and there was a girls' grounds where you, the men couldn't go there. The girls had nice, some, some gardens with a pool and you could go there in your lunch hour. And the, the men had a, had a similar, they didn't have any grounds to go, but they, they had a club as well. And there was a swimming bath on site. Um, I mean, when I first moved, <laughs> do you want to know this? When I first moved there, I lived in Diggs, which didn't have a bathroom. So I used to go to Cadbury's, to the baths, and around the baths were, were bathrooms. And I used to have my bath in, <laughs> in the baths, as it were. Um, you know, they, they, this was still there, you see. Um, it, it's a totally different world, isn't it? Now? Mm. Yeah. It's fascinating. So there in 63, 64, the computer had arrived. Is that, is mm. that right? Have I got the timing right? Um, and did it take long for the system to actually run and get into, uh, into full flow? I, I don't think it did. The trouble is, the thing is, once it's in somebody else's hands, I no longer am part of it. I'm on to the next job. So I don't, I didn't actually get involved in those sort of decisions. There were other people in our office who were, were more involved in that. And we were, um, I mean, the man I went, I started with moved up uh, ahead of me as, I mean, he was already uh, a manager, manager when I joined, when I started working with him. And he got promoted, but he was still in that office. Um, and I think he probably looked after all that and I didn't have to concern myself with it. So the system has been installed, and you think it's now going to run for years, years you on end? You believe it's going to, and they believed it was going to be big enough, and it, they knew they could add bits to it if they needed to. Uh, and the next thing is, you find, that as I, I didn't get involved, but before I left, they were planning to have an, another computer. Gosh, do you know what that was? Uh, that was um, an ICT 1904. Um, not sure why, I mean, it was nothing to do with choosing that and that came in in February 67 but we knew we could attach other things to this one and I think they believed it would run with it but I think they were getting another room for it next door as far as I recall as I say I didn't really get this was going on around me but I wasn't part of it really mm -hmm. I had to keep my head down on my job <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell us what was it actually like working working at Cadbury's I enjoyed it I, I, I had it was very, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I made very good friends. Um, it was all interesting. I, I, I found it fascinating if I was allowed to go, if I had to go through the factory and think it was fascinating. Um, and I, I was away from home. I didn't live in Birmingham. I, I was away, I came up from the Southwest. So I was um, initially in Diggs and then in, um, and then I had a small flat um, 
some in, in a little block, and a few of them were reserved for professional and business women. And um, Cadbury's had an allocation in that block of, I think, 12 flats. So there were 12 Cadbury workers in there, and, and two or three of them were the same, of the same sort of year as me. They, they were doing different jobs, but they, they had come at the same time as me. Um, so, yes, and it's a very pleasant part of Birmingham. Um, the other side of Birmingham is nothing like as pleasant, but Bourneville, a very pleasant area. So uh, I enjoyed my time at work very much. Did you go out and what would you do in the evenings and after work? Well, there were plenty of things on in Birmingham. I mean, it's a good centre. I certainly went to the rep at times. Um, I played, <coughs> they had sports fields and so on. So in the summer I played tennis and in the winter I played squash. I'd never went up thinking I would like to play badminton but they didn't have a badminton court for women, but we had squash courts. And they gave us coaching. I mean, this is through the girls' club. There was coaching. Um, and the girls' club laid other things on as well. And then there were, there were um, I didn't join in as such, but I went to audience. They, did light, they had a light opera company, and they had a grand opera company, and they had a film society. And these, they had a big concert hall where you could go and see these things. So there was plenty going on. And, and lunch was, I mean, they, they had lots of restaurants. And I ate in what was called the Terrace Restaurant and had a set table and got to know the people there. And one was a lift girl um, and some were office people. We were mixed up. Um, yeah, it, was a, it was a nice life. Um, I was very happy there. Very happy there. Oh. Now, when you left, you left a company where they were working with an enormously large computer compared to what we're used to now. Uh, did you use computers in your later life? And what computers do you use now? Or what would you regard as computers um, that you use Only now? within our household. Um, because by the time I'd had my children and they were old enough for me to go back to work, I was totally out of date. Um, somebody at Kalamazoo had known me and said, do you want, but I, I, I would have had to start from, from scratch. I knew nothing about modern computing. But um, as a household, as a family, we encouraged our son and he had the ZX81, I think it was called, and very early one. He used to lie on his stomach in front of our television and sort of work with this. He went on to BBC computers. We went on to a Macintosh. And I used to use that occasion. Um, we now, I now have a, an iPad and uh, my husband works on the main um, Apple computer. So we've, we've, from, we've always had computers in the household, but they're nothing whatsoever resembling what we had, what I was doing before. When you were coding in the initial language, you literally had to work at the coding level. Yeah. And now obviously we don't, no. with the devices that we have. What do you think have, have been the main advantages from someone who's had that experience of computing right from the beginning through to the current time? What do you think have been the main advantages uh, for you or the things that you really appreciate? Well, <laughs> it's just so easy. I mean, I don't have to think about it, do I? Well, I do. I find I'm, I'm always scared of doing something and getting it wrong and messing it up. But you, it seems that you can't actually mess up your... your, your your thing. Um, I don't like some of the modern devices. I certainly, it's not a computer in a sense, but I certainly don't like my mobile phone. Um, it keeps coming up with things or my finger slips or something and I find I've dialed somebody when I didn't mean to. <laughs> I haven't got much control and I don't think I, I like not having much control. And it's all out somewhere else. You don't, you don't know what you're doing. Now, you were working at really some of the early stages of computers coming into, uh, into business and into general life. How did you feel about working in that environment and working with these new machines when they came in? Well, I didn't realize where computers were going to go, of course. We're looking back. We know what's happened, and that was a, a pioneering time. But uh, there were computers around, obviously. And um, this was just the progress that Cadbury's was looking at, and it was... I, I, don't think I, I don't think I was a deep thinker about things at that time. I was age 21 when I started, um, and I don't think I was thinking deeply about what I was getting involved in. I, 
I just was, it was just fascinating that I could do all this. Yeah. And that I suppose that they trusted me to, you know. It's been wonderful talking to you, Anne, and <laughs> it's lovely to hear these stories and all the, th the experiences that you had. So thank you very much for giving up your time coming here during the Cambridge rush hour <laughs> <laughs> and sitting here. Yes, well, it, it, I mean, you know, looking back, it was an interesting time. When you're going through these times, you don't really, and particularly when you're young, you, you know. But I, I was very lucky, I suppose, to get the job even. Um, That's it, thank you.